Welcome to this talk from the Global Kidney Academy uh, Hemodiasis online course on temporary centrovenous access. My name is Nick Farden, I'm a consultant interventional nephrologist based in uh, Sheffield in the UK. Let's look at the learning objectives for this talk. I've put uh, five areas that I want to cover. Uh, the first of these is um, looking at the indications for insertion of a temporary catheter. The second area is the risks and complications associated with insertion. The third um, objective may seem a slightly strange one, um, but I think it's very important. It's looking at all the decision making that you need to think through um, before you um, insert a catheter. The fourth is actually how to insert the catheter and we'll split this up into five subsections when we get to that point. And then finally, uh, post-insertion care. So looking at the insertions for a catheter, um, I'm going to start just by explaining the different types of uh, catheter that can be inserted and what we're going to cover in this talk. So this talk is specifically talking about insertion of temporary uh, catheters. And um, shown on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here are two temporary catheters. Uh, these actually have a central extra lumen, but um, these are catheters which go straight into the vein. So the distance from the uh, skin exit site to the uh, bloodstream is only two to three centimeters. Uh, the x-ray uh, shows the appearance of a right internal jugular catheter. The other type of catheter that you may have heard of are tunneled uh, or cuffed catheters sometimes called semi-permanent catheters. And these can be left in for long periods. We've even left them in occasionally for years where there isn't uh, other choice. Um, the cuff refers to a polyester or Dacron cuff um, five centimeters from the uh, hub of the catheter. And this um, sits within the tunnel under the skin and causes a fibrotic reaction so that over time these catheters get held in place by this cuff and that also provides a barrier within the tunnel to prevent any infections moving up the tunnel uh, and into the bloodstream. So the indications for insertion. I've split these into two groups of two, four broad categories here. Uh, the first pair of indications are indications where a temporary catheter is the best option. So if a patient, for instance, has acute kidney injury, uh, and needs uh, dialysis access, you're hoping in many cases of AKI that the renal function is going to recover. So a temporary catheter lasting a few days may be all that you need. Secondly, if a patient is septic, um, for whatever reason, but classically would be, uh, say, an infected tunnel catheter or um, uh, bacteremic for um, some other cause, then it's unwise to put in a permanent bit of plastic because that could get colonized with the infection. Equally, you wouldn't want to put in a woven graft into the arm uh, while the patient is bacteremic. So in both those two indications, a temporary catheter is the best option. The second two broad areas, however, a temporary catheter can be used, but is not the best option. So the first of these would be someone requiring dialysis access when you know that they are end stage, either because you follow them for a period of time or you've got, say, an ultrasound showing they've got um, small kidneys. In that setting, a temporary catheter is only going to buy you a few days. So why not go straight for a more permanent solution, such as a tunneled catheter or um, maybe a, a Gore-Tex graft? Then the final not uncommon scenario is where a patient is dialyzing via a fistula or graft and that fails. Now, often one can um, either surgically or radiologically unblock them, but if that isn't possible, then a patient uh, needs to dialyze. Again, a temporary catheter could be used, but it's only going to buy you a few days. So that might be appropriate, for instance, if they're going to get a, a further graft in, you might put a temporary catheter in and get a new graft in um, the next day. Um, but unless that was a, an early needleable graft, then you would probably need two temporary catheters. Uh, 
The other alternative is to go for a tunneled catheter. Let's move on now to the risks and complications of uh, insertion. And if I got you to think about uh, what complications you would think of, um, I expect you'll come up with some of the things on this list. Um, most likely you would come up with the sort of first um, one, I imagine, in, in each of these categories. So the operative um, complications, damage to local structures. I imagine you would think about puncture of a of an artery or, or lung or a vein. But the second on the list you might not think of as complications but are really quite important. So failure to insert, insert a catheter is very much a complication because if there was a good indication to insert the catheter and it hasn't been inserted because you failed then that obviously has serious complications. The final one on that, on the operative um, um, list is also very important, which is pain and distress. You might think, well, that's a bit, is that really that important? But it's the one thing on this slide that the patient will remember and will know was due to you. Everything else they might think was someone else's fault. But actually, if the operative procedure is painful and distressing, then they will remember that. And that's important if you um, have to operate on the same patient again. It's also important because they will talk to other patients. And so your reputation, your practice can be affected if you don't learn to insert these catheters without causing pain and distress. So that's the operative period. The early complications, again, infection is the one I'm sure you've all thought about um, and is the big enemy to these catheters. And of all the forms of access for hemodialysis, um, infection remains the, the biggest one for temporary catheters. Bleeding in the exercise is not uncommon and it's uh, due to an operative fault, it's due to making too big an exit site um, and we'll talk about how that could be prevented um, or treated. AV fistula formation, again you may not have thought of, and this is not the, the sort of AV fistula that you want, uh, it's not a surgical one, this is where um, the, introducing, the introduction needle uh, passes through the artery on the way to the vein or the vein on the way to the artery uh, and that can lead to um, uh, fistula forming between the artery and the vein. Usually if it's just the introduction needle then it's small and usually of little consequence. However, if you don't spot that you've done that and you dilate up or even sometimes I've seen uh, catheters that have been inserted through an artery and into the vein uh, and work very well on dialysis until the poor nurse pulls it out and then uh, has the shock of her life when blood spurts everywhere. Um, in that sort of scenario then obviously you can end up with larger um, tracks, larger fistulas, and those need to be closed surgically or radiologically, so should be avoided um, at all costs. And then finally, and very importantly, is um, this area of, of occlusion and stenosis of veins. Um, if we put in catheters badly, or sometimes just bad luck, they can be put in well, but the fact that the patient has had a catheter means that that vein can uh, thrombose, uh, can stenose, and can completely occlude and that's important because patients um, sometimes run out of venous access. So how can we avoid some of these complications? Ultrasound guidance. I will mention this a number of times in the talk because I think that really we should all be using ultrasound guidance for vascular access. I appreciate that that isn't always available and may not be available yet where you work but I think it's something that you should want to move towards if it's not your reality now. The second really important thing is about asepsis. You can have the most perfect technique into the vein in a pain-free way uh, every time uh, without complications. But if you get sepsis, so if, if, if your aseptic technique or things that you're doing are not right from the aseptic side, then obviously you've done the patient a disservice. And then the, the really third important area is about training. Um, actually, ultrasound alone can mislead uh, an inexperienced operator because they look at the screen, they see a little dot, and they assume that dot is the tip of the needle. And that is not necessarily the case. So real-time ultrasound, you do need to, to, to be fully trained. We talked about bleeding from the exit site, and as I said, this is due to 
um, the skin incision with the scalpel blade being too large uh, and that's a matter of, of training to get the right size or if you realize you've made too big an exit site to put a stitch in uh, so that it doesn't bleed. The bleeding usually is from the skin edge itself rather than from the vein and then thirdly we've talked about pain and distress and the way around that is is um, to be empathetic. Imagine it was you lying there and someone was inserting a catheter into you. What would you want uh, to be done to you? Would you want someone to, to talk to you, to treat you with respect, uh, to pause? I mean, we've all had, whether it's just minor dental surgery, I expect everyone listening to this talk will at some point have uh, had some sort of surgical procedure done on them. Uh, and the way that is done makes a big difference to how we remember the event. So let's look at now decision making. What do I mean by this? I want to cover a number of, of um, things that should be passing through your mind each time you um, approach a patient. So the first one of these is, uh, uh, is this the right moment to insert the catheter? I mean, that may seem an, an obvious question, but sometimes it is possible to wait. Say the patient has got a potassium which is slightly high, you could manage that medically and insert a tunnel catheter the next day. Or the patient may be suitable for urgent surgical access. The second decision that you need to think about is, is this the right environment? Or what can I do to change this environment to make it better? Uh, and with that, what equipment have I got available? Do I have ultrasound now? If not, could I get ultrasound? Is ultrasound available if we wait until tomorrow uh, and someone else can, can bring the ultrasound machine uh, to the patient? So those are questions that you should be asking. And then the final one, which is probably the most painful for, for any doctor reading this, is am I the right person? I think doctors are often quite bad at... at uh, answering that we tend to be taught to just to cope with whatever but am I adequately trained or should I be waiting until someone um, who is better trained is available because actually if you do this badly you can cause complications um, damage something patient gets septic have a bad experience so doing it badly is worse sometimes than not doing it at all Continuing on this list of decision making, which is the right vein to use? You know, should we be inserting into the femoral, into the right internal jugular, the left internal jugular, the subclavian? Um, and I'll, I'll cover that uh, now as we're talking about it. Certainly in Sheffield, we would only, and pretty much in the UK in general, we would never send someone home with a temporary catheter. So these temporary catheters are always being used in the context of an inpatient stay. And therefore in Sheffield, our default position, our default vein for a temporary catheter is the femoral vein. And the reason for that is that that then frees up the neck veins. It doesn't use these up with temporary catheters, um, meaning that we can then get a tunnel line in early. And in Sheffield, no one waits more than a few days for that. Um, uh, so, so that would be our first choice. Sometimes, though, the femoral isn't appropriate. For instance, if the patient has um, central obesity, they may cover the whole of their groins with an apron of fat, um, or the patient may have spina bifida, say, and uh, um, tiny legs and femoral veins, uh, or there may be other reasons, such as, you know, again, for a spina bifida, maybe being in a wheelchair um, or making it very hard to have a, a groin line in. Uh, and in that case, the next uh, vein of choice should be the right internal jugular vein. And the reason I split up the right and, and left internal is that the right is a straight line down from the uh, entering the vein to the right atrium, whereas on the left, as you'll see later, there are two curves. And whenever you're putting a catheter th uh, through a curve in a vein, it can cause damage to the endothelium, uh, and that can lead to um, a greater risk of stenosis and occlusion. And the final choices are the subclavian veins. Now, I've left them on the list, but I think everyone um, re here in this talk will already know that subclavians should be our, our least preferred option. And the reason for that is if you use the subclavian vein, 
the um, rate of stenosis is high and um, the use therefore of that arm of the ipsilateral arm for access therefore um, is uh, potentially compromised so but sometimes it is the right choice so if the patient has great veins in the left arm but the right internal jugular has already occluded then it may be appropriate to use the right subclavian rather than the left internal jugular and then the final thing I think you should always be thinking about is what comes next. It's easy to, to do a procedure and pat yourself on the back when it goes well. But unless you're thinking at that time what comes next, then uh, you are um, putting the patient at a disadvantage. So you should always be thinking, what am I doing next? This only buys me a few days. Now, sometimes what next is that you hope their kidney function is going to recover. But if, it, if it's not that, then you need to be planning for uh, the next dialysis access. I've thrown at this point, before we move on to how to insert the catheter, a case history. And I just suggest that you uh, pause the recording at this point and just read through this case history um, and then try and answer the three questions. So let's look at the answers that you uh, might have come up with. Um, and it's worth saying that there isn't a, um, I've, I've carefully scripted this so that there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer for each question. Um, uh, but I think you just need to be able to justify whatever. So would you, would you insert a temporary catheter? I think I would. And the reason I would is that the patient is breathless. We know from the chest x-ray that there is some evidence of pulmonary congestion uh, the patient is is uh, pretty uremic uh, and also has um, high potassium and uh, a low bicarbonate. So I think for all those reasons, it would be uh, quite reasonable um, to um, put a catheter in and dialyze. However, if you said no, I think you've got to justify why that should be. And that, and that justification should include, well, she's passing some urine. Maybe I could treat her with some diuretics. Uh, that might bring the potassium down um, and then we could uh, review tomorrow I'd want to see the ultrasound scan that sort of um, argument so the second question is if you said um, if we are going to insert a catheter which vein would you use um, so I've stated from Sheffield what we would say which would be we'd always look at the femorals first but I've again this patient is fairly um, short for her weight um, and with a BMI of 37. So it depends where she's carrying that weight. If she's a sort of uh, central obesity apple build, then um, she may well be covering her femoral veins, making it difficult to access those. Uh, and if that were the case, then um, the right internal juggler would be the right choice. If, however, her weight was mainly around her hips uh, uh, and, uh, and not central and the... Um, femoral veins were easily accessible, then I think that would be a, a very reasonable first choice. And then thirdly, what plans would you make for future access? Um, and again, you don't have all the information you need. So I think that uh, if I was answering that question, I'd want to know what the ultrasound, because everything really depends upon what that ultrasound shows. Um, there's evidence to suggest here, so if the ultrasound showed normal sized kidneys, you might say, well, this is likely to be sepsis. Um, equally, there's a bit of blood and protein active sediment in the urine. Could this be some form of, of acute nephritis? Um, and if those are the case, then a temporary uh, catheter is, is reasonable. If, on the other hand, it shows small kidneys, then obviously you need to start planning uh, pretty quickly for um, uh, permanent access, or at least semi-permanent with a, a tunnel catheter. Let's move on now to um, uh, how to insert the catheter. And as I said at the beginning, I've uh, split this topic up into uh, five subsections. I'm going to talk about uh, asepsis. Um, we're talking about uh, the use of local anesthetic, actually how to puncture the vein. Um, and I cover that under both the ultrasound technique and a landmark technique. We then look at the uh, cell dinger part which is the passage of the wire and then the, um, the dilators and catheter over the wire. 
Uh, and then finally, where do you want the tip of this catheter to end up? So, asepsis, I've already said how important that is. So, is the environment um, clean? What can we do to improve it? So, uh, is this the appropriate room? Have you got a dedicated um, insertion room? We certainly do. and We try and use those wherever possible, although sometimes you have to uh, compromise on that. So, we have two insertion rooms in Sheffield that are cleaned regularly. Um, we claw clean them to try and, and, and um, they wipe down the surfaces um, with uh, a bleach basically to try and kill any um, dust and bacteria in the environment uh, wherever possible. However, if the patient uh, has diarrhea, then it may be more appropriate to do it um, within their own side room. If you are inserting it, uh, the catheter, on the patient's own bed, what can we do to improve that? So can we um, change the sheets, uh, um, put a new gown on the patient, just try and, and reduce the amount of, of dirt uh, and infection that is around. Uh, and then thirdly, the patient, I include that within the environment. So the this is before you start the procedure. Again, in Sheffield, we give all our inpatients who are going to have a temporary catheter a, um, a bed bath, um, or if they're able to go and shower, um, they can go and shower, but using some chlorhexidine 4% uh, surgical scrub. The next area on the list is, is how do you clean yourself? So it's your own aseptic technique uh, about doing a proper surgical scrub, making sure you're not missing uh, the backs of the hands, uh, and very importantly, how you gown up um, so that, uh, in particular, the outside of the gloves never touched your hands, even though they are your hands have been washed, they're not completely aseptic. Third area is about skin prep. Um, we only use 2% chlorhexidine and alcohol. There are two other main options. One of those is betadine, and the only indication for that, um, I think, is now where the patient is chlorhexidine allergic. There's also 0.5% chlorhexidine and alcohol, um, and there is a small amount of evidence that 2% is better. So I think if you can get hold of 2%, that is a good way to go. The cleaning twice is a, is a personal thing of mine. So what I would do um, is I would pre-scan the patient with ultrasound, make sure the vein is patent where I'm thinking of going, clean away the jelly, and then I clean the area, put on a non-sterile gloves and just clean up the area with some 2% chlorhexidine. Um, you can either do that by tipping some onto a pack of swabs, which is what we do, or there are uh, pre-moistened um, uh, swabs uh, that can be used, uh, sort of large swabs, um, or you can get these um, uh, uh, sponge on a stick where you, you break a glass vial, release the chlorhexine onto the sponge, and then use that to clean the area. And so I would do that before I go and get scrubbed. I then come back, and after I've scrubbed, I will then clean again. And um, you don't have to do that. You can just clean once, but I think it's, it's good practice. But where you do clean, make sure you're cleaning a much larger area. So if you're expecting um, to expose a, a 20 by 20 centimetre area of skin, try and clean 30, 40 centimetres um, squared of, of skin so that you're cleaning a larger area. The next area is adequate sterile drapes. I have seen, thankfully not recently, but I have seen in the past, people trying to insert a catheter using a, a tiny um, uh, 12 inch by 12 inch, 30 centimeter squared um, uh, drape. It's just ridiculous. The wires in the packs you're going to use are going to be a minimum of 16 centimeters, often 80 centimeters. And you know, you therefore need draping so that if the wire um, at full length um, does drop onto the patient, that the whole of that area is, is adequately draped by sterile gown. So you need the right amount of, of drapes. And those can either nowadays be paper drapes for a single use, or uh, if you've got access to cotton drapes, that's great. We no longer do. And then the final one is about minimum handling of the catheter. This is something that I feel strongly about, and it's just a way of, of reducing the risk. This is just a, a picture of me uh, inserting a tunnel catheter, the final stages. And as you see, the actual catheter, I'm trying just to uh, 
uh, use a, a bit of clean gauze rather than use my gloved hands just in case I've picked up some bugs um, from the cleaned skin. Local anaesthetic um, it comes in various strengths um, normally between 0.5 and 2% I would only use 0.5 or 1% and if you've only got two you can dilute it down just using some normal saline. Um, very importantly is about putting it in the right layer. The most sensitive layer you're going to pass through is the skin and so many people start by sticking the needle into the skin. You should lie your needle flat on the skin and then just uh, go a millimetre under the skin surface and inject with some local anaesthetic. That raises an intradermal bleb uh, and if you or the nerve endings are in the dermis. So make sure you get the dermis anaesthetized and then the patient won't feel uh, anything um, like a scalpel blade going into the skin. Inject slowly. Local anaesthetic is stable in acidic solution so they the manufacturers make the solution acidic and that stings but if you inject slowly um, and if you dilute with a bit of saline that also helps um, but just inject slowly then, then um, it will sting less. And the final point here is to use adequate amounts, particularly when you're learning, you don't always follow the same track with the introduction needle as you do with the temporary needle, with the um, local anaesthetic needle. So just anticipate for that, go in and out with your local anaesthetic so that you anaesthetize an adequate area. Um, when I first started putting in tunnel catheters, I used to use 20 mils of local anaesthetic. I now use an average about uh, three to five mils to put a tunnel catheter into a patient. But that's experience, I've done thousands. Um, but when you're learning, make sure you put in plenty because if you, if you go, if you follow a track that you haven't anaesthetized, uh, the patient will tell you. Ultrasound. What I want to show you just with this uh, slide is uh, about how the beam of the ultrasound looks. Uh, I know this is an arm that we're scanning rather than a, a neck or, or femoral. Um, but it's just to illustrate. So the left two images at the bottom are um, a longitudinal cut through a vessel uh, and the, the right two are a cross-sectional short axis view. Uh, but what comes out of the um, ultrasound probe is a, a beam which is about one millimeter in thickness. And that's very important because when you're looking at the needle tip all that you see is where that needle tip um, transects that ultrasound beam. And that isn't necessarily where the tip of the needle is, and that can lead to confusion. So, if you've got ultrasound, how should you use it? Uh, the first thing you should do is you should always pre-scan. Uh, so, pre-scan is essential. It shows you that the vein is patent. It tells you something about the position of that vein. Sometimes you can be surprised. I remember the first time I ever used ultrasound was on a right internal jugular vein and the vein was lying medial to the artery and it should lie lateral to the artery. So I wouldn't have found that if I didn't have that ultrasound available. Um, so uh, always pre-scan. The second point here is about short axis, long axis. No, it just saying if you've got ultrasound and you can get the appropriate training, learn to do both because there are advantages and disadvantages of each view. Um, sometimes one is better than the other. Um, I love long axis view when going into the femoral vein and that's the one I usually use, but sometimes it's harder. The reason I like the long axis view is that you can watch the whole track of the needle as you pass down the ultrasound plane. You see the needle entering the, the top wall of the vein and you can position the tip of the needle right in the middle of the lumen. Um, it also tends to take you a nice shallow angle into the vein. But sometimes that isn't appropriate, so when I'm putting a tunnel line in the neck, you have to use a short axis or a modified long axis because um, you've got such a short distance between uh, where you're entering the skin and the clavicle. The third point on the list uh, is probably the most important. Am I seeing the tip of the needle? And that's all about the training. So uh, everything about the training should be saying, is this the needle tip? Is this the needle tip? And the techniques you use 
um, of tipping the needle or, or moving the ultrasound probe um, so that you follow the needle tip. And the final thing about ultrasound is that you can see if the vein is collapsed. And if the vein is collapsed, uh, if you're if it's a pre-scan and you're seeing that, you might want to fill the patient up with volume if that's appropriate. But if it's during the procedure, you can you can tip the patient head down into a Trendelenburg position, or if they're cooperative, um, you can ask them to do a valve salva to hold their breath, to strain, and that will often make the vein much larger. So, what about the landmark technique? I, I, I put this in, not that uh, I really want to encourage you to use a landmark, I think it is outdated, um, but I appreciate this may be the reality for some of you. So the, the landmark is a, is a, is a mixture of um, recognising the um, anatomical landmarks, uh, feeling for the arterial pulse, and then um, using the local anaesthetic needle to um, carefully run in alongside the on the right side of the of the artery uh, until you find the vein and the reason you use the local anesthetic needle obviously is a much smaller calibre needle um, so right internal jugular vein we use the two heads of sternomastoid uh, shown here or in this diagram um, below and if you can't see those just simply get the patient to lift their head up off the um, pillow for a second and that shows you the two heads uh, more clearly. You then feel for the artery and the vein, if you look at the top right now, the skin is at the top, so the vein is lying superior and the further up the neck you are, it should lie lateral to the carotid artery. But as you move down towards the clavicle, this is a, a low view right down here by the clavicle. As you get low down, you find the vein actually overlies uh, the artery. Um, that isn't a problem if you've got a nice large vein like this. Obviously, if the vein is collapsed, then uh, it's easy to pass through and into the carotid artery, which is what we want to avoid. So, in this case, feel with your left hand for the artery and um, go down slightly towards the ipsilateral nipple. The nipple is over here on this image. It's not quite as far as that. You're aiming a little bit more medial around this position uh, with your needle just pass down and if you don't find it then gradually get a bit closer to the midline um, um, until you find the venous um, blood so uh, yeah this is just a nice little there we go that's a needle going in very pretty so next the uh, femoral veins so I've shown you a right femoral here uh, and uh, the the landmark here is the inguinal ligament which is the groin crease um, you don't sort of feel the muscles in the same way the sartorius muscle here um, but you feel instead the artery uh, and in this case the femoral vein lies medial to the artery and inferior so again on this ultrasound image here you see it lying uh, medial and, and inferior and uh, as you move towards the inguinal ligament, the, the vein tends to get more separated, more um, to the side of, to the medial side of the artery. As you come further away from the inguinal ligament, it lies more underneath the artery. But if you puncture right up here, uh, then the skin puncture, then the patient's, it's right on the skin crease and it's uncomfortable. So the compromise usually is to puncture a little way away, feel the artery, but actually you puncture the vein nearer the inguinal ligament where the two are separated. Because if you don't have ultrasound, you can't begin to hit it when it's lying underneath. You have to hit it, um, the vein, when it is um, separated away from the artery. Uh, I think there's a nice little there. Yeah, there we go. Right, lovely needle going in. So the next thing is about the correct angle of your of your introduction needle. It's easy to um, uh, go too steeply and that's particularly the case when using ultrasound. Uh, so in the early days of ultrasound, it's a bit like this. The, patient, the only way the operator could see the needle tip was to go in almost vertical with the needle tip. The problem with that is 
it becomes very hard to get your wire to, to go down because the needle tip is against the vessel wall. Also, if you use a skinny catheter, so this is like a, a quad lumen skinny catheter, then they're pretty flexible. But if you put in a big, thick dialysis catheter, you're forcing it to do some bends and it uh, actually can lead to a stenosis uh, by irritating the uh, endothelium. So the better way is to try and do a more shallow angle. And at this point, once I've got blood back, I would use the ultrasound, if, I've, if I'm using ultrasound, just to scan and to make sure that the needle tip is sitting right in the centre of the lumen. Then your wire and your caster should pass it easily. And because it's a sort of a smooth angle in, uh, hopefully you won't lead to a stenosis of the vein. So talking about the passage of the wire, you've, you've now got into the vein, you've got uh, some blood out in the syringe, uh, it's not pulsing, you know it's venous, um, uh, but you're unable to pass the wire. Why might that be the case? Well, a common reason is that is that when you've been taking the syringe off the needle, that you've actually, the, the needle tip has dislodged and is no longer in the vein. Quite often, because you're so, we're also worried about pulling the needle out, we tend to push it in. So quite often it's actually gone through the vein to the other side. So if that's the case, the first thing you do is, if it wasn't, the wire wasn't feeding, is leave the needle where it is, put the syringe back on, draw back, see if you get blood back, and then if you don't, gradually, keeping a suction on the syringe, gradually pull your needle out until you get a good flush of blood. And then come back another few millimetres, it's a bit scary, but do it, just come back a few more millimetres, making sure blood is still flowing, then take the needle off again and pass the wire down. The next reason is similar, but this time rather than the needle tip being outside the vein, it's just against the back wall, as you saw on the previous illustrations, often to do with that steep angle of, of, uh, of the puncture. Uh, and uh, again, if you just pull the needle back very slightly or flatten the needle, it's not ideal. Um, better still, though, learn to puncture at a more shallow angle. The third one is that the vein might be occluded or stenosed, and, and that can be difficult to work out. And, and um, with experience, there are a few things that you can you can do, but but um, it's it's a difficult one to to um, to teach you about. And it's just uh, doing numbers. Uh, you can learn to manipulate the wire uh, and to feel, and after a while, you get a feel. But the the, the long and the the short of it, you really need uh, angio facilities at that point to put some contrast down uh, and to see if that's the case or not. The other thing you can get is a tortuous vein, and, and I come across these not uncommonly where the patient's had a previous, say, right internal jugular tunneled line. Uh, that stays in for a few months. They then dialyze on a, a fistula, um, and then that fistula fails, but I'm asked to, to insert another tunneled line. Uh, and when I, when I um, tried to pass the, the wire down, it doesn't go. And this is the sort of anatomy that you're talking about. So as I pass the wire into the right internal jugular vein, it's all, there's a bit of a kink uh, in the tortuosity of the vein and uh, a standard J wire just gets stuck. Now, you, if you've got facilities and, and uh, um, uh, an angio, then you can use special hydrophilic wires that will happily cross a little kink like that. Um, uh, but but all you can do is is just try and manipulate the wire and see if it will pass. But sometimes that's why the wire won't feed. It's not that the veins occluded. It's just very tortuous. Okay, say so you've got your wire down, but it's difficult to insert the dilator or the catheter. Why might that be? So. Again, one of the things we see is that is that people try to insert the dilator uh, steeply. They they saw the needle going steeply, and so they they try and insert the the uh, dilator going down into the skin. But actually, you you don't want to go too steep an angle. 
in because the vein is only running um, just under the skin. So um, usually 15 to 30 degree to the skin angle as you dilate. Uh, and whenever I dilate, I always move the wire in and out. I'll cover that bit more in a moment to explain why. Because if the wire moves freely, then you know that the um, uh, that the catheter isn't the wire uh, isn't kinked. So here is an example where that is important. So a wire has gone down the right internal jugular vein, but rather than passing into the right anonymate vein here and then to the SVC, it's instead passed towards the right arm into the right subclavian vein. When you come to dilate, the dilator gets stuck. Uh, now in this case, you've got very little wire down and if you're not careful, you might just um, push it down anyway, but that's dangerous. Um, it's not so dangerous here because it's a straight line, but you always want the uh, wire to go down first and the catheter to follow the wire. So the way you can tell uh, there's a problem is, is that you, you try and move the wire uh, with your left hand. So as you're dilating with your right hand, the wire should move freely. If it gets stuck, like in this situation, um, it's, it's kinked. And in this case, because it's gone down a side vessel. Uh, so again, you'd have to pull your wire back and to re-manipulate down into the um, SVC. And then the final reason can be that there's a stenosis or occlusion. Sorry. The wire's down, so it must be a stenosis rather than an occlusion. So, what about the uh, where to position your tip catheters? This is obviously a, a schematic uh, of the central veins here in blue. Uh, so, the SVC shown here um, is where you want to put a skinny catheter, so not a dialysis catheter. This is central venous pressure monitoring uh, drugs delivery through a, a narrow lumen catheter. Whereas for a dialysis line we need to be right down here in the right atrium. If you position your your catheter tip in the SVC you won't get the flows. It will keep alarming on the machine um, and uh, you need to have it further down into the right atrium. Uh, so that will be a temporary uh, RIJ line or uh, a left uh, IJ line. So what's that look like on an x-ray? That's the way you're going to tell where your catheter tip is. Um, so what can you see as you look at this x-ray? Well I hope you spotted that the patient's actually got two catheters. They've got a RIJ skinny catheter uh, but they've also got uh, a left internal jugular tunneled catheter. Uh, so a nice smooth curve here round passing through the anonymous. And these these two curves that I was mentioning earlier uh, from the IJ into the left anonymous and then left anonymous into the SVC and right atrium. So what are the landmarks? So is that a good position for a skinny line? Is that a good position for uh, the tip of uh, a tunneled or, or temporary catheter? Well, the landmark for the skinny line is usually the carina. If you uh, outlined it here in red, uh, the trachea uh, and the carina uh, and that's usually about T3-4 uh, so that catheter is perfectly placed. The tip of the uh, dialysis line needs to be within the right atrium and I've marked out here the right atrial borders and as you can see it probably goes a bit further than you might have first thought. Um, you see the right ventricle here coming round uh, and the tricuspid valve is um, round about here entering to the RV and this is the position of the IVC. So again that's a pretty good position although be warned this will be a, an inspiratory film and so when the patient isn't fully uh, breath holding the catheter will be a little bit lower by a centimetre or so. So a little bit long but just about okay. My final slide is about post insertion care. Um, so make sure the catheter, when you, you put it in, make sure it's, it's secure. Obviously, you don't want it to fall out, but there's another reason for making a catheter securely fixed. If the catheter uh, is, is loose, then it can move in and out of the skin, 
and that's more likely to carry any bugs, uh, colonizing bugs from the skin surface under the skin and then into the vein. So I make sure that the stitches are, are fairly tight to hold the line in place. Obviously it must be covered by a dressing at all times. However, every day that dressing needs to be removed to have a look at the exits on it. And if there's any erythema or, or pus, then um, that catheter needs to come out. Now, if you are sending patients home with these catheters, we wouldn't do that for a temporary catheter. It will have to be checked each time they come for dialysis. But don't risk leaving a catheter in too long, um, because if they get septic, uh, then you've done the patient a disservice. The next thing is think about the um, DVT risk, and that's particularly true for the femoral catheters. Um, so if you put a catheter into the femoral vein, obviously it can partially obstruct the uh, venous return from the leg. Often the patients are, are spending more time in bed than they would do anyway. So make sure they're on uh, low molecular weight heparin at the appropriate dose for their level of kidney function. And the final thing is, don't leave this catheter in for too long. Seven days is an absolute max for a femoral juggler line. 14 days, again, absolute tops. We would try and get them out usually by seven to 10 days. Uh, so have your next plan ready. That may have to be a, a further temporary line if it's acute kidney injury. But um, I would encourage you to try and, and get into inserting tunnel catheters. Here's a bibliography. Uh, I've chosen five papers uh, which are pretty well written and they're all available freely online. Um, so if you follow the links, you should be able to access those. Thank you very much.